Hello, I'm David Rubenstein. I'm here today with Bill Ackman, the noted investor and philanthropist and increasingly tennis player. So, Bill, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, nice to see you. Okay, Bill, um, the markets uh, seem to be uh, strange to somebody who is not following them quite the way that you do. Uh, the, the, the economy seems to be in a recession, a fairly deep recession, yet the market is almost where it was uh, when we started this recession. Can you explain that, why the market seems to be so much higher than the economy is? Sure. So, you know, when people talk about the market, they talk about either the Dow or the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index. And what's interesting or fortunate and unfortunate about the crisis is it affects different companies differently. And the more dominant large cap, you know, companies, the more, the stronger the balance sheet, the stronger the market position, those businesses are huge beneficiaries of, of the crisis. Um, and what the, what the market does not reflect are small businesses, private companies, more levered businesses that uh, don't have access to capital, don't have the same dominance as the public market. So a business like Amazon, which is a very big component of the uh, the market, is you know is up 45 percent. That does a lot, obviously, for the averages. It's probably something approaching almost 10 percent of the S&P index today. And my guess is you know six seven percentage points of the index. Businesses like Google, Facebook. Uh, I think long-term beneficiaries and uh, ultimately the value of a business is the present value of the cash it generates over its life. And even if the cash flows are disrupted in the short term, if they're greater in the long term, the values will be higher. So I think the stock market is a snapshot of a portion of the economy. If it were, if you had an index of smaller businesses, uh, the market would be down 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. So the market also seems to gyrate more than normally. Uh, we have market going up a thousand points, down a thousand points. Is that because of computerized trading or why is the market gyrating so much? Uh, the, you know, again, the, the market is a discounting mechanism and uh, people's estimates of the future uh, have been very volatile. You know, how long is the crisis uh, going to go on for? Uh, when will we get back to our normal life? You know, these things affect the input of the model uh, that analysts are, are using to value uh, securities. I think the other issue is the market in the short term is very much a sentiment index. It's a way for people to express their emotions. And uh, there's been a lot of emotions in the short term. And when that happens, uh, there's a corresponding degree of volatility. Uh, but I, I don't think the market is dramatically wrong. You know, when you look at the market on a company by company basis, when you look at the companies we own, uh, you know, different businesses have been affected differently. Some, you know, many businesses have been, will be long term beneficiaries. Uh, not long ago, you made a very uh, spectacular investment, as I rem remember it. It was $27 million you put on a hedge, in effect, and it became worth more or less $2.6 billion, something like that, about 100 times your money. So I don't know if you've done a lot of those 100 times your money deals, but uh, was that something that you expected that would go up that much? And uh, you were later criticized by some for having gone on CNBC and and kind of talk down the market at the time when you had a short position. Can you explain why you made the investment and why the criticism might not have been fair? Uh, sure. So uh, what we did is we bet that credit spreads would widen, which I thought was a very, very low risk bet uh, in the sense that credit spreads were at the all time tightest levels ever going into what I thought would be a fairly serious economic crisis. If we were wrong about the economic impact of the crisis, we would have paid, again, a relatively modest amount of premium, uh, you know, to be wrong. So it was a very asymmetric uh, bet. And, you know, unfortunately, things played out the way we expected in terms of the economic impact of the crisis. You know, if you actually watch my CNBC segment, uh, all 28 minutes of it, which I think a lot of people didn't do, uh, as opposed to the snippets that CNBC advertised after my presentation, I, I actually gave a, a, a where I said, well, look, we're at a fork in the road. If we go down one fork, it's doom and damnation. And that fork was a, a one in which we did not, in effect, shut down the country briefly and carefully reopen the country. It went down, just let the virus go roughshod. I, I felt it would have very dramatic uh, economic and health implications. That was the, the part I was most concerned about. Um, but as I said in my 28 minute presentation, that I was actually quite bullish because I was very confident that the government would, in effect, shut down the country and that would you know, stunt the growth of the virus, allow us to reopen the economy. And what I said on CNBC, that's why I'm buying stocks. And uh, I made, uh, we went bullish, you know, we were very, very bearish going into March, March uh, 12th. And on the 12th, we started buying stocks very aggressively and we started unwinding our hedge as quickly as possible. 
I went on CNBC on the 18th. By the 18th, I had 3.3 billion more exposure than I did on the 12th. And I was really, in a way, I was talking my book, and my book was bullish. I was betting that the country would be shut down. And, and fortunately, I think for the country, uh, California initiated the shutdown uh, within 24 hours, and then New York State, and then the rest of the states have have largely followed. And that's why you, you're going to have the opportunity for an economic recovery, and the, the virus will kill, you know, only 150,000 people instead of you know what what could have been millions. But the yeah, the unfortunate part is the uh, you know CNBC ran you know 30 second segments where I talked about the fork in the road where of doom and damnation and they didn't run the segments where I was saying actually I'm bullish. So if you go back and watch, you'll come away with a very different impression than uh, some people okay. perceive based on short snippets. Well, do you have any more hundred times your money bets that you might be able to give to us uh, where somebody might be able to make a hundred times their money in the not too distant future? Any good bets you might recommend? Sure. So the the it's a bit of an overstatement to say you know we ended up you know spending twenty seven million dollars on the insurance policy on which we collected uh, two point six billion, um, but we had to as you know the way that bet is entered into is you commit to pay five hundred million dollars per year for five years, and the longer you keep it on, the more you can lose. So it's a little bit different than someone who can scrape together you know ten thousand dollars and make a hundred times. So it was a it's a bit of an overstatement uh, to say we made a hundred times, but it was it was a very good hedge, and uh, we were able to invest the money in the market and protect our investors' capital, so we felt good about it. Okay, so let's say, Bill, I told you today with absolute certainty, no doubt about it, that the next president of the United States would be Donald Trump. He's going to be reelected. You know for certain. Would you short the market? Would you go long the market? What would you do? It really wouldn't change anything that we're doing. You know, our strategy is to buy super high quality, dominant uh, companies that can withstand a pandemic or a dramatic movement in interest rates that are not particularly exposed to the economy. Uh, so, you know, who the president is, it, it's not something that we would make a bet one way or another on the portfolio. Okay. The same thing would be true of Biden. If I told you with certainty he's going to be the next president, you wouldn't change your views, right? No. Okay. So you are what's called an activist investor, not a macro investor. An activist investor typically invests in companies or makes spe specific bets on companies, the direction up or down and so forth. How did you get into being an activist investor as opposed to, let's say, a value investor, a macro investor? Was it something you decided to do while you were in college or early in your professional career? What led you into that route? I think it's part of my personality. You know, I, I started as an investor. I raised the first pool of capital when I was 26, uh, and I made an early investment in a company called Rockefeller Center Properties. And I saw management making a series of decisions that made no sense to me. It was just so obvious the right thing to do as to how to create value. And it was being a frustrated passive investor that made me into an active investor. And you know, that investment turned into a very profitable and very high-profile investment. And in, with success, uh, you know, one is motivated to, to try it again. And uh, it's been helpful to the strategy over a very long period of time. And it's fun. And uh, if you're passive, you can feel like the market's patsy. And if you're active, you can actually create some value. And I think it's a lot more interesting than just picking securities. You know, we, we bought a stake in Chipotle at a time where the company was struggling a few years ago. We put a few directors on the board. We recruited a new CEO named Brian Nickel. It's completely turned around the company. The stock has, you know, almost tripled in the midst of a crisis. Uh, and it just tells you that, you know, that's a lot more fun and it's a lot more profitable. And it's, I would say that good for a lot more good for America than just simply being a passive stock picker. So Pershing Square was started in 2004, your current vehicle. Where'd you get the name Pershing Square? Sure, so uh, right in front of Grand Central Station was used to be a square uh, that was an open grass, you know, sort of public gathering space, uh, you know, over time. Grand Central Station was built, you know, there's that little bridge over, over it, but it's at, that location is still called Pershing Square. And our offices were at uh, the corner of, you know, uh, right in front there, 110 East 42nd Street. So I liked the name and, you know, it was available. <laughs> so that's what led to uh, uh, our choosing. You started in 2004 Pershing Square with, I think, $54 million. So if yes. somebody had invested in 2004, part of that 54 million, and they kept it with you, what kind of compounded a rate of return would they have today? Uh, you would have about 11 times your money and, and about a 16% IRR. Okay. And are, are there people that have done that, that kept their money there the whole time? Yes. The, lo the very loyal ones. It's not been a straight okay. line up, to be clear. 
Okay, so let's talk about for a moment um, some of the campaigns you've done as activists. Some of them have worked out, some have not. Uh, Chipotle has seemed to have worked out, but you did a couple that were difficult ones, so Herbalife or Valiant. Uh, they didn't work out. What would you say is the mistake you made in hindsight and that you would try to avoid in the future? Sure. So there's sort of eight principles that have driven our investment success. And when we have veered from those eight principles, uh, we've lost money. And uh, after the uh, 2000, we went through a very difficult period, circa 2015, 2016, the two investments you mentioned were big drivers of that. It was, uh, you know, if you will, experiences making mistakes and learning from them. And it was a moment of reflection for the firm. And I went back to the core principles that have driven our success for the first 12 years. And I had a member of the investment team literally engrave them in a stone tablet, not dissimilar from Moses' Ten Commandments. And I had that stone tablet put in a, what you might call a deal toy, it sits on everyone's desk in the office. And uh, we've adhered to those principles you know, ever since. And you know, we've been fortunate uh, to return to you know, the success we had for the first uh, dozen years. So I think it's about keeping to, you know, our, our principles are basically, we want to invest in simple, predictable, free cash flow generative dominant companies with large barriers to entry that are in high returns on capital, that have limited exposure to extrinsic risk we can't control, strong balance sheets, don't need access to capital to survive, have excellent management, good governance. Sounds logical, um, but you know, occasionally we've diverged. And there's uh, those times, you know, there's a certain discipline that comes with investments and there always seems to be a countervailing quality that caused us to diverge. Uh, but in really each case where we've compromised on business quality or complexity, we've been harmed from an investment standpoint. To be an activist investor, my impression is you have to be a fairly tough person. You can't be a shy, retiring person because people are going to criticize you. So did you develop a thick skin relatively early? And do you feel OK being confrontational at times? Or is that a problem because you're just not your personality? Sure. I'm generally not a confrontational person. You know, I had my, my one little episode with Carl Icahn on CNBC that had a, a, got a fair amount of attention. Um, you know, I didn't actually choose to debate Carl Icahn on television. The, you know, the, to the credit of the network, they, they brought him on in the middle of an interview like this one where we both had an opposing point of view uh, you know, on an investment. I, I do think it's a strategy that requires a thick skin, but you know, I think uh, anyone who takes high profile positions, not just on investments, but on any issue, particularly at this moment in history, is going to get slammed by one side of the debate. It's the inherent nature of a, of a divisive country and you know, fairly strong opinions on both sides. But I, I've always had the view that if you take you know, a public strong position that you have a lot of conviction in, you're gar and no one, you know, no one pays attention, that maybe there isn't that much substance to what you have to say. So I, I, I guess I take it as favorable and, and can also often be instructive to hear the opposing point of view, uh, as long as it's not an ad hominem criticism. You know, I have, I have no objection to someone taking the opposing point of view at all. Let's talk about the economy for a moment. Um, right now, it seems as if we've borrowed an enormous amount of money to pay for the uh, recession, in effect. The Fed has put up maybe four to six trillion dollars off its balance sheet. Congress has maybe put up so far three plus trillion, maybe close to four trillion. So are you worried about the debt having an impact on the economy in terms of the value of the dollar, inflation, or just the size of the debt and our ability to pay it off? Sure. So, you know, if you think about the country as a business, uh, the country has a lot of intrinsic value, a lot of asset value. I would say one of the most valuable assets of the country is the, you know, the country owns 35% of uh, your income and my income. In a way, you can think about that, you know, that's the tax, the current you know, level of, uh, of taxation, federal taxation. So that's, in effect, the country owns a 35% stake in your intrinsic value and my intrinsic value as a, as a contributor to the economy. And the country retains the right to change that uh, percentage ownership at, it, at its will by, by, in effect, changing, you know, obviously tax policy. So there is, then, of course, we have enormous assets, whether they're real estate assets or infrastructure assets. Um, you know, that are, so I think the, the asset side of the U.S. balance sheet is very, very large. Obviously, uh, you'd never want to let the, the liability side of the balance sheet grow too much. And there are a lot of not just debt liabilities we have outstanding, but we have, you know, Social Security, you know, the, the enormous health care costs, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, you know, that we bear as a country. So it's something that is concerning. Um, you know, we are fortunate finding ourselves in a very low interest rate environment. Um, but, 
it's something to, to think about and be concerned about, uh, but it's sort of difficult to do the same kind of calculation of, of the, the net of the uh, leverage nature of the, of the United States unless you do a proper uh, valuation of the asset side of the balance sheet. So we're, we're in a technical recession. We're technically in a recession, I should say, and fairly deep, but right now, when do you think we're likely to come out of this recession in the third quarter, fourth quarter or next year? Do you have any views? Yeah, I, I think we're going to, you know, begin a recovery, you know, certainly by year end. I don't think we'll be back to anything close to a normal economy until probably the second half of 2021. I think if we have an early uh, vaccine, if, you know, uh, Pfizer's been talking about a potential distributable vaccine by the fall, uh, that will obviously make an enormous difference. I think if we can reduce the treatment of the virus to, you know, one, a test you can take at home and get an accurate result in 15 minutes, and it's a it's telemedicine to your doctor to get, you know, the, the doctor to say, okay, you need a prescription for remdesivir in a inhaler format, and you can stay home for two weeks and be fine. You know, those things will make a fairly uh, significant, uh, you know, positive impact. But I think the we've had kind of a sloppy closure of the country for the virus, and we're gonna we're having a bit of a sloppy opening. So I think you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna have business confidence return and consumer confidence return until you know, the kind of people feel safe, truly safe. If I had to guess, that's really more like the second half of next year and into, you know, the beginnings in Q4 and, and Q1 and Q2 of next year. Uh, you said sloppy opening. What you mean is uh, there's a lot of cases in Texas and Florida of people getting virus now and it doesn't seem like it's uh, disappeared. So are you worried that this could, without a vaccine, keep going on through all of 21? Um, I think what will happen is you know, the, the, the healthcare system is getting better and better at treating the virus. So, you know, they're learning when to put people on a ventilator, more importantly, when not to. They're learning which drugs can have a positive effect and what, you know, learning more about what doses and earlier, you know, when to, when to give the, the medication. Testing is improving. And I think all of these things will, you know, will, will, are positives and will improve confidence and reduce, uh, you know, kind of risk. Um, things will be a lot better, I think, in a few months, although you're going to have some states with a lot more cases because people have not been careful, and those states are going to have to moderate economic activity and maybe, you know, go to a mode of protecting more aggressively, you know, people at risk and being more cautious, uh, you know, again, all the things which will temper the economic recovery, but I do see a, you know, kind of gradual improvement in all fronts as the global healthcare system, every medical researcher in the world basically working on solving one problem and a lot of resources going into it. So I think I think by the fall, we'll feel a lot better if we can take death off the table, uh, if we can take severe illness off the table. I think that's certainly possible in this calendar year. Uh, people are going to feel a lot better about living and going out and living a more non normal life. So if Jay Powell called you tomorrow and said, look, I'm not sure what I should do. Should I do more? And if um, the Secretary of Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, called you tomorrow, should I pass another bill working with Congress? What would you tell both of them? Would you say we need more help from the Fed? We need more help from Congress? Or would you say we've had enough help? Um, look, I, still, I think we have to protect the most vulnerable people economically uh, during this you know, period of time. And I don't, I don't know, you know when do these programs precisely run out? Uh, you, you need to design programs. You know, I, we've, I've heard and we've made a lot of investments in the restaurant industry where you know some of the benefits are at a level where they're more they're better than you know fifteen dollar per hour sort of the you know minimum entry points for many private businesses and it discourages people returning to work so you need to design them in such a way that you don't reduce economic incentives to return to work but you have to have them large enough to protect people you know during one of the more challenging times particularly for people at the at the lower end of the economic scale. Now you mentioned earlier that tech companies seem to have done pretty well. Your firm seems to invest more in, let's say, consumer retail, or at least some of the visible ones are in that area. Are you a tech investor in the sense of investing in tech companies, or is that something you plan to do in the future, or you wish you had done more of? Sure. So look, there are always you know, investments I, I, I would rather not have missed. I feel like I could have figured out Amazon, but that's a, a, a backward-looking uh, sort of approach. But I don't think Amazon so much as a technology company. You know, uh, in the same way I, you know. Starbucks is a, in a way, a technology company. One of its competitive advantages versus the, the corner coffee shop is its, you know, digital ordering and delivery and and uh, contactless uh, way of in interacting with customers. I think every business is is a technology company. 
What we are not is we're not investors in pure technology companies. We wouldn't invest in a self-driving company with no revenues, but we might invest in, a, in a, you know, many of the businesses we own are heavy users of technology, whether they're consumer facing or whether they're industrial companies uh, or, or manufacturing businesses. I mean, you know, we're looking for businesses with very attractive economic characteristics. There are many so-called you know, companies that are in the NASDAQ, people think of them as tech companies, but they have the kind of economic characteristics we like. We just don't like businesses where a couple of uh, young people in a garage uh, you know, somewhere in uh, Silicon Valley can come up with a disrupting technology that just intermediates the business. Suppose a young person at your alma mater, Harvard, or any other college said, look, I'm watching Bill Ackman. He's a smart guy. He's making some money. Uh, I'd like to do that. I, I, I want to be hired by Bill Ackman. What do you look for when you're trying to hire young people? You want somebody that's exactly like you? What, what are the skills that you're looking for? So we're really a private equity firm that invests only in the public markets. And so when we've recruited for the investment team, if that's what you're referring to, we're looking for people, the, the typical candidate spent a couple of years in investment banking at a, in a great training program at a big firm, a Goldman Sachs, et cetera, uh, Blackstone, or the old version of Blackstone, uh, you know, their Blackstone advisory business. We've recruited some people uh, from there. And then, you know, several years in private equity, you know, because private equity investors focus on simple, predictable, free cash flow generative businesses and focus on businesses that can support a large amount of debt and, and, and really determine valuation, think about industry dynamics. So we're looking for someone with you know, that kind of a background, you know, usually four or five years out of school. And then, uh, and then they join the team and, and we've had a lot of continuity and duration for people who've have come to the firm. But we hire very, very few people. We only have a seven person investment team. The plan is to keep it quite small. Well, when you had your problems uh, a couple of years ago, you alluded to and I talked about Valiant and uh, for example, um, did you ever lose faith that you would be able to turn your business around? And did you ever doubt that you could make this a successful business again? Uh, sure. So, you know, I think the, I've always liked to say that success is not a straight line up. And uh, I, would, I would give these talks at business schools about how you deal, how to deal with failure. And then I failed. <laughs> and I had to implement the strategy that I was uh, a proponent of to business school students. But I, I think the key you know, look, we have a, a business uh, with a strategy that makes sense. Uh, we made some mistakes. Uh, experience is learning from those mistakes. That's the key. And then, you know, I was, I was quite confident that if we adhered to the principles that built the success of the firm, or re-adhered, if you will, that we return to success. And it's just a, it's a question of duration and, and every day coming into the office and making decisions with, with good judgment and, and being level-headed. And, uh, you know, with time, I was confident that you know, things would recover and, and, you know, feel very fortunate that things have worked out the way that we expected. But I'm certainly going to be, you know, now at 54, uh, I'm done making mistakes. <laughs> so that's my, that's my business plan going forward. We're going to be very, very watchful about uh, veering from the course uh, that has led to our, you know, our, our success. In recent months, you've been running your company, I assume, from your home. I, I assume, and has that made it more difficult or easier? And what have you learned from this experience? Do you think you can run the company from your home in the future, just like you're doing it now? We could, but it's far less fun. Uh, and that, you know, one of the reasons why we can run the company from, from our respective homes is that we built a real culture and almost a family-like uh, environment among the people and, and a culture of trust and respect. And, you know, we, we all like each other, um, but, we can succeed doing this because we view it as a temporary solution. I would say, uh, you know, we've been incredibly effective and incredibly productive, uh, you know, working from home, uh, but uh, it's harder to have the separation between your job and your life. If you, you know, I think it's actually very, very helpful to come into an office and then when you leave, leave it behind you. It's a lot harder. I'm working from the, if you will, the den where my office is located. My parents' bedroom is, you know, sort of over there, uh, you know, the baby, you know, sometimes I hear her crying in the kitchen, you know, so it's, it's quite beautiful in a way, this moment with, you know, living with my parents for the last almost four months and I have a 13 month old child. I've, I've gotten remarried relatively recently. I, I'm very fortunate to, to uh, have, you know, beautiful family, um, but uh, it works from a temporary standpoint. And I also think, uh, you know, it will be easier if I have a day where I need to focus on family, where I can operate from home. And that's true for other employees. So I, I think we, we can get to a model that's better than what we had, but it's going to be centered around a, an office environment.
Now, in recent years, you've become a very active uh, philanthropist. You've signed the Giving Pledge. You're involved in the Giving Pledge effort. What are the areas that are your greatest passion in philanthropy? So, uh, you know, I, I like the inherent leverage of, a, of a, you know, an asymmetric risk reward in business. And I like the same thing in philanthropy. So we've done a lot of investments in what I would describe as early stage businesses that are designed to address social uh, problems. Many of them are nonprofits. Many of them are actually, you know, a B corporation or a for-profit or something in between. And uh, we've had some Google-like uh, outcomes um, where we've, you know, bet with an organization very, very early, you know, an organization, you know, the organization with a budget of 100,000 or 300,000, and we give them 3 million at a very early stage of their development. And that, now they've become, you know, organizations that really move the needle. So I find that stuff very sort of, uh, I'm passionate about that kind of structure, but you know, in terms of what we focused on, economic empowerment, social justice, addressing income inequality, um, you know, we've done some cancer research, uh, kind of backing kind of early, you know, sort of younger scientists before they can get grants from the NIH. It, it's really been about backing very talented, I would say, entrepreneurs and people who are passionate about solving a problem with either a for-profit solution or a not-for-profit solution, and I'm even more passionate about the for-profit solutions to a problem. Not that we're trying to make a profit, but that we're building a sustainable organization that can address a problem that doesn't need to constantly rely on uh, an annual grant from a foundation. I mentioned at the beginning that you're a tennis player. Uh, you didn't play in college, but you've taken up uh, tennis recently. I think you're pretty well regarded as a tennis player. Um, do you wish you had played tennis earlier? And if so, do you think you could have been a professional tennis player? So I played in high school. I was a good state level player. I was told by the Harvard coach that I had a good chance of making the JV. And he told that to about 50 other young people. Um, and there were probably four spots on the, on the JV and the rowing meeting was across the hall. And about 15 minutes into the tennis meeting, when I saw how many people were there, I went across the hall to the rowing meeting. I ended up rowing for four years and it had a profound impact on my life and my uh, ability. I, actually, you asked me the question, how do you get through a difficult business period? The answer is it helps to be a rower and, and endure a severe amount of physical, uh, <laughs> mental torture, which was a big part of the big part of rowing. So I have no regrets, although the last 15 years I've taken up tennis and I'm a vastly superior tennis player. I can play a you know very high level tennis game uh, much better than I was, you know, when I went to college. So I think I had the best of both worlds feel very fortunate. So um, I've told you played with John McEnroe. Can you beat John McEnroe? He's a little bit older than you or not quite yet well, there. I, I played with John McEnroe about 12 years ago. I had kind of a funny incident where uh, we were playing doubles and it was for, for, for a charity and I hit an overhead and I hit him with the overhead. I, I can't think on, the, on, you know, probably twice in my life I've hit someone with an overhead. He spent the entire rest of the match doing his best to hit me back which you know really gives you a and by the way i have a lot of respect for john McEnroe and his personality uh, but it was a fun fun moment I, I i think it's extremely improbable that i could beat john McEnroe in a singles game but with an equal partner i would give him a good run uh, in, in the doubles but yeah one of the greatest players ever and you know i, I really enjoy playing with him and i, I we win a few games and hopefully more all right. Well, I hope you get to play again with him. And I want to thank you for taking time to be with us today. And I hope uh, you can find a couple more, more or less 100 times your money uh, bets, though I realize it wasn't quite 100 times your money, but it was pretty successful. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it.